Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ryan the Ride Mechanic channel. How the heck are you doing today? Listen, I'm excited to be doing another video in the segment about how launch rides work, mainly electrical launch rides work. So I wanted to dive right into it today and uh, talk about it. So today I'm going to be going over linear inductive motors and launch rides. Now get ready. Here we go. <laughs> First of all, look at you. Thank you for showing back up and watching my videos. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you're here. Welcome. Just like the last video, I'm going to be sharing some of my knowledge with you and things that I've learned by working on this equipment and pretty much picking up things as I talk with manufacturers and builders alike. I'm getting this information directly from the sources, the people that build the stuff. And I don't necessarily know all the science behind it, but I have a rough fundamental knowledge of how the stuff is supposed to work and go together which is way more than a lot of people can say, and you pretty much won't find this content anywhere else out there. So just want to let you know what you're in for. Along the way, if I mention something like dates, history, anything like that, and I'm wrong about it, I can be wrong about these things. It's not a big deal. But uh, I tried to get some of the information, a little bit of history behind some of the stuff just to make things a little more interesting for some people. I know uh, some people like that information, so I tried to put a little bit in there for y'all. Okay, so let's talk history for a brief, brief moment. The first time linear inductive motors were really used in an attraction, I say attractions, it's not really a roller coaster, just an attraction, I believe was Walt Disney World 1975 when they opened up the people movers all over the tracks instead of like Disneyland, they had kick tires all over the place. Disney World opened up their people mover with linear inductive motors lined the track and which works great because it doesn't care about weather, friction, anything else. It's still able to move those vehicles around just fine. Flash forward, in the early 90s, Disneyland was refurbishing Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and they asked the director at the time, said, hey, we need to get the trains in and out of the station faster. So the director looked around and got a hold of some linear inductive motors and put them in the ride. Uh, you could still hear these, they're still there today, they function just fine, and you can see them when the train moves in and out, if you know what you're looking for. Um, so as the train moves in and out, you hear this slow hum underneath the train. Those are the motors pulling the next train in and moving the next one out to make the loading and unloading process go quicker and speed up the ride throughput. That was pretty cool. Flash forward to 96, Premier Rides built Flight of Fear, which was the first linear inductive launch ride, I believe, that was put out there. So that's a little bit of history to it. So first thing we're going to talk about is LIM. What's LIM stand for? Linear Inductive Motors. On launch rides, these are the little white rectangular boxes that you see along the track. But the key thing to understand here is that a one of those little white boxes around the track is not a motor. One of them is not a motor. One of them is a stator. You put at least two stators together and you get a motor at that point. Sometimes, depending on the array, you could put much more together, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and then electronically bind them together, and now you have a very large motor. So let's talk about linear inductive stators and how they're constructed. On the inside, there are six sets of windings inside there, UV and W, RS and T, depending on which company, which uh, country you're in and all they are is essentially magnetic winding very heavy magnetic winding wrapped around an iron core so what's magnetic winding you find it everywhere on speakers and everything else like that I have some here this is like you, you rewind speakers with right here so I have a heavy winding on the right left whichever way it is for you and then a lighter winding right here and all you do with these to make an electromagnet is wind them in a circular fashion like that. That's all you got to do. And then here's the same one. Just like that. Now, you take those and you give them a heavy iron core. Sure, why not, right? And you take that, slide that guy on there, take that, slide that guy on there. Now this is essentially a linear inductive element at that point in time. 
but the way this is facing on the track is the trains moving this direction or this direction either way and the reactive fins go on the outside of it this way so and this is uh, this iron core has little ripples in it that match all the way up against the outside of that box and this electromagnetic force is generated outward away from the coils like that so that's essentially and you got six of these one two three four five six all put together in that little white rectangular box and there's six of them one for each is actually two for each phase it goes in let's say this is phase one and then it comes in this wire leaves on the other wire and then those two connect with each other and then it goes into and out of this one they're wound in such a fashion where they both create the same polarity at the same time so you don't have to worry about mixing up polarities inside the wiring's done internally so all you see is two cables one coming in one going out and they're typically wired in series with the next motor on the opposite side of it so that's how a stator is constructed internally there's no real good pictures of this out there the the knowledge i have of that is actually taking a stator off of a ride and then sticking a bore scope on the inside because they're sealed up pretty tight and we didn't want to open it because we didn't know if they could be rebuilt or not so uh pretty pricey they're like 14 to twenty thousand dollars a stator so we couldn't just rip into one just to see what was on the inside although all of us really wanted to do that so while those stators are operating, they generate a lot of heat inside of them because um, you're dumping a lot of current through those windings. So you need to cool them down. And there's two ways to really cool them down. Well, kind of three. I've seen one park adapt that. Uh, so the first way is like the park I worked, we ran air through the inside, took a big high blower fan, you pumped it into one side of the stator, it ran across all those windings were standing up on the inside so it was able to cool the windings and then it went back out the other side same concept but they use water for the other type of cooling now I don't know about you but electricity and water don't mix but they don't need those big heavy fans blowing around all over the place you could put ethylene glycol or something like that inside there to cool them down more um, so and they, they're actually quite quiet when you use them. Uh, for people out in the, uh, the one I know of for sure is the, uh, the old California Screamin' or it used to be the Incredicoaster. All those stators on those rides are water-cooled. That's the reason when it launches you don't hear that loud scream coming from the stators like you do on other rides Ready? so they use water pumping through them and I imagine they're heavily shielded on the inside to protect against ground faults electricity running like that the last step of construction on those is the the outside white coating that's on them it's not just a paint found out very long after I worked there because I thought it was just paint it's actually a heat sink compound that's sprayed on the outside also very expensive if you were to buy the stuff again um, and it's specially applied so it's not easy to do but that's actually designed to uh, help the stator cool from the outside with air blowing over it or in some cases I've seen water blown over it too but uh, water typically makes a real nasty mess with that stuff so most everything everywhere is air-cooled. To the outside of the stators, there's heavy iron reflectors that are used. The reflectors are designed to basically take the magnetic field that's coming off of that stator and just kind of going everywhere. And it tries to hit that reflector and it can't go past it. So the field, the magnetic field, is basically bounced backwards towards that motor. Um, trying to keep that field in that very tight little narrow gap, which is only... I believe it was eight millimeters wide it's not very wide it's 
very small. When the reaction fin is inside there, you can barely fit a credit card on either side of that fin. The tolerances for manufacturing the track and everything else have to be extremely precise in order to get that train running down the center. There is no reflective material used on the center of the stators, between the two stators, because you have the left and the right working together. They should be round, wound in such a way to where the lefts basically create a polarized magnetic field and the rights will create the opposite polarized magnetic field. Since you have six sets of windings, you should have a north winding and then on the opposite side, a south winding. North, south, north, south, north, south to make that effect so the magnetic forces don't try to go everywhere. They try to link with each other in the center and that is one of the reasons there's no reflectors or anything like that in the center of the stators. By the way, if you're liking the channel and you're liking the videos, please like and subscribe. It helps me out, lets me know what people like and don't like. Also, feel free to leave comments down there in the bottom. I love watching comments and seeing what happens. I love talking with people. It's great to get out there and network with people and find out what uh, where everyone comes from and the walks of life we all have. Uh, also, if you have something that you feel is too long-winded for a comment or maybe it's not the right place to put it on a video or something, uh, you can also email me at ryantheridemechanic at yahoo.com. I have an email for that too. If you wanted to send stuff over there, feel free to do that. Contact me there too. By the way, in these videos, I'm still doing the maximum amount of e editing on these things because I am looking off of bullet points left and right like crazy, and I still I haven't gotten a teleprompter since the last one. I kind of think I should, but um, I'm really not used to reading scripted stuff anyway, and I, I just don't want to do that. Anyways... Let's talk about the reaction fins that the motors work off of. So when the motors create an electromagnetic field, they need something to grab a hold of, and that's the train. Well, the train underneath it has these very large fins, three of them typically. You have, either have three in the center, which is like a, I'm just going to say it's an Intamin style. Not, not for sure if Intamin's the only one that uses that, but I'm going to say it's an Intamin style where you use three fins in the center, or you have like a, I believe, Premier is the other one that uses the uh, reactive fins, but they put them out to the side. One fin for each side. Uh, so you have three fins in the center, one fin out to each side, and those are called reactive fins. Uh, they are what generate the driving force for the train, and they are made out of a very special compound that is not a well-known thing. It's kind of a trade secret, the exact uh, metals that are inside of them. But predominantly, they are copper, aluminum, and then a very little amount of nickel in there. And the, the fins are very expensive, they're very heavy, and they can't uh, easily be remanufactured. So if you need it, if you bent one or broke one for some reason, it would be a very long time to get another one of those things. So those are the reactive fins that go through the center. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about operation of the unit. So what you have is that when you say, hey, I'm going to drive something forward, you have that left stator and the right stator that I was just talking about, and you energize those stators, and you create a, let's say, positive and a negative field, and it has the reaction fin between it that creation of the positive and negative field is not what's driving the train forward. That creation of the positive and negative field create an eddy current inside the fin. The eddy current is the thing that actually links everything together. So you take that positive negative, you energize them, and it creates an eddy current. So how do we move that forward? Well, there's a couple ways to do it, but the predominant way we do it is we take that field that we've just made, and then we shut it off, and then slightly ahead of it, make another field. Now, that eddy current back there, as soon as you shut that field down, that eddy current goes away. It disappears. And when you create the next field in front of it, it creates another eddy current, but it's in a different spot. So you get no forward movement at all. So what they do is for each one of these times they do this, they use a lot, and I mean a lot, of current dumping through those windings, right? So this was my heavy current winding right here. So let's say to create magnetic field on my light one, 
I need to dump, let's say, a tenth of an amp through here at 12 volts. This guy right here, if I dump a tenth of an amp through it at 12 volts, it won't even make a field. Not at all, because the winding's too big. The electricity goes straight through it. It's like a direct short to ground. So what I do is I take 5 amps and I dump it into this guy. And then the result is actually an extremely strong magnetic field that comes out of this guy. But downside, that field takes a long time to collapse. So what you get is you get windings that are wound inside the stator for high current, low speed. These are windings that are put together in motors that are typically in the station, right where the launch is. And then further down the track, you have these guys, which are high speed, lower current. I say lower, they're not low. Anyways, so what we do is we take that back to where it was. What we do is we take that and we say we're going to dump a ton of energy into that winding and it produces a very large eddy current on that, on that fin, on that reaction fin. And then very quickly, we collapse that field and right in front of it, we make another field very large again and create another eddy current. Well, this time the eddy currents want to kind of join with each other or not really a good way of saying joining with each other. The eddy current that was there wants to just get stronger and bigger. So it's actually attracted to that next field. So as I was saying in the, uh, the break video that I made a while back, basically to simplify it, the electromagnets, let's say, create a north polarity and the eddy current is a south polarity. So we collapse that field and go just slightly ahead of it and make a north polarity again. Now, if you're looking at it this way, sorry for the hand visuals. So if you make a north polarity here, that south polarity that was right here, it now wants to try to follow that. So you say, okay, we're gonna make north here and south is gonna try to follow it. And then we cut that guy off and then that field starts to collapse. And then just a little bit further, we make another north field and that not only gets bigger again, but it tries to follow it again. So we do that and we make this giant AC wave that's firing down all these motors the entire length of the train, but it's doing it through all six coils, through both sets of stators, the entire length of the train, and it's doing it, let's see, what would that be? 60 hertz is wall voltage, uh, typically wall voltage what we use. So we're doing that at 120 hertz. That means we're sending that pulse to accelerate down that train 120 times per second at roughly 5,000 amps to drive that train forward. And I say, whoa, that is a lot. It's like, absolutely, that is a ton. Speaking of ton, those trains that you're sitting on weigh about 14 tons, right? We don't put the passenger weight inside there because when you talk about how much people weigh, it's relatively nothing compared to the actual weight of the machine. And then you have the guide wheels and upstops and everything like that are crushed to the track for those particular rides. So they generate even more friction. I know if you just turn the ride off and want to push one of those trains, it takes like six to 10 people to push a train. It's one of those instances I've talked about where roller coasters don't want to roll. Those are it, impulse rides. So the more current we put into those motors, the more of a burst of energy we get out of it. And then the faster we send that wave down the track, the faster the train will go. Now, you need all the motors stuck together in a very tight little area to get the bulk of that energy moving quickly. And then you'll notice on these rides, once they get out towards the end of their track, you'll see that the motor segments or the stators, typically in like groups of four, they start getting further and further and further apart because the windings are getting smaller and smaller and smaller on the inside. That way they're able to create the current and collapse it quick enough as the train passes by. 
So those big workhorses in the station that are used to shoot the train out would not be a good fit for the other end of the track where they have to accelerate the train up to 60 miles per hour or something like that. So those are difference in stators. Now, the current that we dump into the stators with the frequency versus what the train is actually doing, that's your drive loss. Now, it's something that's not normally thrown around. No one's like, oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. It's not really there. But I'm saying that you could be telling that ride to put 120 hertz at 5,000 amps down those motors. And if the train doesn't go anywhere, that's 100% loss, right? But when we do that initially, and we give it that burst, and those needles jump off the scale in the control room, the train starts to accelerate. Is it 5,000 amps of speed? No, it's not. So you have a lot of loss as you try to bring that train up to speed. But that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons why we have those rides, is because they're so much fun trying to get that train up to speed, right? That's what we all want to go and see and do. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the acceleration of the ride and we've talked a lot about how the drive has to do everything so let's talk about that drive for a minute the older drive systems for like this linear inductive system I'm talking about it's very high power and it's extremely high power actually uh, the what the park had to do to run it was they had to bring in the 13 kV that the park runs up runs off of that's 13 kilovolts that the park runs off of and they had to bring it in and they had to run two transformers with that voltage. Each transformer stepped a 13 kV down to 500 volts at a lot of amperage. A lot of amperage. And then that would go inside the control room. Now what they did is they used two different transformers and they stepped a voltage down to 500 volts delta on one side and then 500 volts Y on the other side. And that's the way the, the power is phased. That's how they phase the transformer internally. And uh, for most people, you won't know anything about the subject. It doesn't mean much. I asked one of the engineers that was there uh, from the company that built the thing. I'm like, why the delta, delta and Y power phasing? What is that all about? And he said that at a um, theoretical level, because it's not really practical, but it's at a theoretical level, he says you have three phases of each. He says, theoretically, the three phases don't align with each other. They're actually slightly offset like this. So theoretically, the ride actually has six phases of power coming in. But the reason they do that is to condition the power. So instead of having the wave of each phase at the very top where you would see it, it's just this very tiny little ridge going across the top. And that's the reason they do it, is to filter the power in. So they bring that power inside, and then they break it apart into DC, direct current, at 1,000 volts, because you have 500 AC, which is 500 positive, and then 500 negative. So they break it apart into 1,000 volts DC, and they store it in a capacitor bank. Now, the capacitor bank is not used to supply the ride. The capacitor bank is just part of the filtering process. So the transformers are really what's supplying the power, but the capacitor banks take this noise of power up here and they provide rock solid, rock solid power right there while this is happening above it. So this is power coming in, this is your power coming out. On the other side of that drive, they use IGBTs, which are interesting little components. You'll have to look up what those are because they are... I, I can't even explain how they use them basically, but they're basically switches that take that current and then they put it onto a bus bar system that feeds everything. That current is arranged back into, it's a basically AC again, but it's square wave AC. So it's DC pulsed on and off. And then that runs to a bank of thyristors. Thyristors are switch, essentially glorified relays in this case because they're every single motor has this thousand volt dc bus sitting underneath the thing but depending on what where the train is it turns on a specific thyristor in that spot 
So as the train's going out, let's say motor number 15 is down here. As the train is launching, motor number 15 has no electrical power to it at all. And as it comes up right before it gets to motor number 15, that thyristor turns on right as that train gets to motor number 15. And the motor 15 continues to use that power to drive forward. So that's how the thyristors work and put everything all together. So the thyristors are constantly turning on and off in fashion as the train goes up and down the track. Makes sense because you don't want all the power going everywhere. It would cost a ton of energy and you wouldn't be getting anything out of it. It's like leaving the light switch on in a room where you're not in. So as I was saying earlier, the motors are not all wound the same. Some are wound for torque, some are wound for speed. And the drive knows that and it's adjusting its frequency and rate position depending on where the train is, where that IEA net system is saying, hey, this is where the train is. So it's adjusting its voltage and current constantly as it goes along. Also uh, accounting for rider, like rider load. If there's nobody on the train, it'll drive the train one way. And if it's fully loaded, it'll drive it a different way. Both have the exact same outcome. It says, get it up to this speed by this point in time. And the drive's able to do that effortlessly. Does it no problem. So it's constantly using those to give real-time feedback and across the motors and everywhere else like that. The induction motors can be used in reverse as well. I mean, many rides have a swing to them. It's no big deal. The same thing, the pulse is not necessarily like stopped in reverse. The pulse is simply just fired in a different fashion. Because out of three phases going, which is the easiest way to think about this, is three phases. You typically fire phase one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Well, if you take any one of those phases away, there's no direction. You can't use two phases and get a direction off of it. It's not until you add the third phase back in that gives you your direction. Anyone that works in electrical maintenance and stuff like that knows on a three-phase motor, when you wire up the, th the three phases, if it's going backwards, all you do is you unplug two phases. It doesn't matter which two they are. You just unplug any of the two phases and reverse them and plug them back in and the motor will run the other direction. Otherwise, only a two phases, three phase motor on two phases, it doesn't know which way it's going until it gets that third phase in to identify it. Might not be the best analogy, but so as the train is driving out on the track, uh, the motors, again, are constantly firing just ahead of where the train is. And they typically fire on the front three quarters of it. And the back is really not used except for when launching because there's plenty of current and speed once the train gets up and moving. So that's one thing. Um, when you come to a stop, you do the same thing, you can fire the motors just all in one time and create a break, or you could fire them slowly in reverse and bring the ride back down to a safe stop. It depends on how the drive is actually wired up and what the manufacturer of the drive said they wanted to do with it. Now, when you're homing, you have a different problem because now you're not looking to take this 14 ton train and jam it to the other side of the track. Now you're looking to take this 14 ton train and you have to stop it in a window that's only four millimeters wide. That's where the train has to stop every single time. So what they end up doing is taking your high current stators and they start putting lots of current through them, but at a very low frequency. It's only 15, 30, 40 Hertz, something like that. And then depending on how that train is moving, which is where rider load comes into it when you're homing that train back home, depending on where the train is at that point in time, the drive starts doing all sorts of funky stuff, trying to get it into that last little spot. And so if you ever stand there while one of these trains is homing, they sound really weird. It sounds like a growling coming from the train. It sounds like a uh, one of the things I always thought it sounded like was a, a coffee pot that was about to break. It's making all sorts of like... <laughs> as the thing's come into a home. And it's just, you sit there and like, you're not used to it. You sit there like, oh my gosh, what is this thing doing? 
but it's using high current at a very low frequency, just trying to nudge 14 tons of load on the track, which is not very easy to do. And remember, it's got to stop in four millimeters of a space. That's, that's the width of the screwdriver. That's where it has to stop the train each time. Not easy to do. When you're talking about stopping also, as the train's running along, you sometimes have to push the e-stop. Something happens. The linear inductive motors are not powered under an e-stop because when you hit the e-stop, you say there's an emergency of some sort. We don't know what that is at all. So you hit the e-stop, and then everything cuts off. The drive turns off, the air shuts down, everything turns off. So the rides that use linear inductive motors have no way to stop unless there's something external stopping them. So that is the reason why they use eddy current brakes that typically either come up or out or something like that or drop into the track to grab these trains. And because of that reason, the eddy current brakes, if you've watched that video, they can't be used to hold the train. They could only be used to slow it. If the track is flat and level like a lot of launch rides are, then the train will come to a stop and won't go anywhere. But if it's like a block and there's multiple trains on the track, you still need a mechanical pinch brake. So that's the reason those rides have those eddy current brakes and can't just come like swing to a stop or something like that because they need it to stop, they need it to stop now, and the drive can't be used in those cases to do it. If you wanted to use the drive to stop the ride, the rides have a function like a ride stop or a quick stop used where the drive can actually fire and slow down and stop the train and then probably reposition depending on which button you hit. Most of these rides are looked at in three different parts. You typically have the manufacturer of the ride itself, the track and structure, which is someone we'll just say like Entman. Entman built the track and structure. Well, Entman also built the train. That's part number two. So Entman built the track and structure and built the train. And then they used an external supplier uh, someone like Intrasys or someone like that to build the drive for the ride. But the drive includes power filtration, it includes the power assembly in the back, it includes the stators out on the track, and it includes the feedback system, which in a lot of those rides is the, uh, the net system that watches the train's uh, linear speed. So there's actually three components to it, and it's because there's three components and the manufacturer typically doesn't control the third one, that's why they're very difficult and there's a lot of downtime when they start messing up. Because there's not a lot of great technology wrapped up inside that says, hey, this is exactly what the problem is. Granted, most linear inductive rides are old too, where the technology wasn't available. But uh, there's typically not a lot in there, so you have to get the manufacturer on the line of the ride, tell them everything that's going on, and then after the manufacturer has exhausted all of their troubleshooting and knowledge and know-how, then they have to bring the manufacturer of the drive in, and that manufacturer will continue troubleshooting with you. Sometimes it's something you can do where you can take measurements and do things and make repairs out on the track. Sometimes it's stuff like somebody has to physically fly to the park to figure out what's going wrong, because sometimes you have problems. The systems are tested each morning. There's a uh, what's called the thyristor test to run every morning. Press a button and it systematically tests all the motors going down the track and gives you a power voltage current feedback on there. And it basically says, yes, everything's running okay. So they do have a little bit in there, but it's not much on those rides. All right, I've probably bored you all to sleep by now, but if you're still awake and enjoy the video, make sure you like and subscribe again, helps me out. If you didn't like the video, I guess just go back to sleep. That'll probably work out for you too. Anyways, I'm Ryan the Ride Mechanic. Have a good day. Bye-bye.